There we go. Hopefully everybody can see and hear me now. I'm going to go ahead and get my screen up and there's our chain again. Uh, hopefully everybody's good on their side. Let me go ahead and switch over to presenter form from over here. And uh, I know we're starting a few minutes in, so uh, I'll try to get right into it. Uh, we wanted to spend a little bit of time getting into some of the lessons learned that we've seen either firsthand or that we've seen working with some of the customers and partners we have out in the field uh, and share some of that knowledge with the group over here today. My name is Barinda Roday, and I'm a product manager with Tipco Mashery. So I, I wanted to start with this uh, comic strip. It's something that's that you've probably seen 10, 20 times before in the past, but I think it, it continues to actually be a really relevant one in that I think people continue to have the perception that whenever something new, great, or shiny comes out into the field, um, that it's some kind of magic bullet. And you know, Kubernetes is, I think, one of the most prudent examples of that in recent times. Uh, more often than not, when people in pro approach us and we start working with them on their journey uh, from moving from, let's say, managed on data center infrastructures to uh, their cloud uh, or a cloud strategy, uh, there's often some kind of misconception that by simply implementing some kind of an orchestration uh, stack, whether it's Kubernetes, it's Swarm, PKS, uh, that if they li simply lift and shift the content into there, that it's going to take care uh, with some kind of a magic wave, a lot of the problems they have. And anybody who's gone down that path before knows that that is simply not true. And more often than not, it actually leads to a lot of frustration because sometimes taking some of these technologies and trying to deploy them into containers in that specific scenario uh, actually adds the operational overhead just because some of these tool sets were not designed to operate or run in that kind of an infrastructure. So, um, you know, that's kind of my preface in saying that as we go through some of the lessons learned, uh, there's no single one of these points that's going to fix every single problem uh, or challenge that uh, we encounter. Uh, and I think nor is it a requirement to do all 10 of them. Um, it's obviously not an inclusive or fully uh, inclusive list, but uh, uh, I think as, as much as you can, taking these concepts to heart um, as you go through the implementations, design conversations, I think will lend value and unique perspectives and set you up for the best manner and success, um, even if it's incremental and not all the way through. Uh, so at that, I mean, I just kind of a carrying across the introduction from over there. Uh, it seems like it's a little bit of a truism, but APIs are everywhere. They are changing everything. Uh, you don't need to look too far past the times that we're in now, obviously, with the challenges that are present presented with COVID. Uh, the ability to react and change the way businesses have been engaging with their customers in a more digital uh, manner, in a more improved digital experience has been really prudent in how some of these companies have flourished in taking advantage of new checkout options, more seamless experience integrations uh, versus some of the ones that have struggled to make that migration because once you eliminate that brick and mortar aspect, even if it's temporary and you have 100% of your alliance on that, that e-commerce, that digital uh, channel, uh, it really starts to put the kind of infrastructure technology you have in place to the test. So, uh, you know, it's a great quote. We'll have a case study a little bit later on that I'll talk through a bit from Caesars. Uh, but a couple of years ago, I think a digital transformation initiative uh, would have been a nice to have, right? So a lot of people had stacks. They were functional. Uh, some may not have been optimal, but they worked with the uh, typical upkeep and maintenance. But I think now more than ever, whether it's to innovate so you can stand out amongst the crowd or whether it's simply to adapt and, and, and be able to react to the changing tides, uh, you really need to be able to transform your business and you need the tool sets in place so that you have the ability to make those kinds of changes without having to dramatically retool and reshift your infrastructure every time you need to go down that path. So uh, starting with the lessons learned over there, I think, API-led is something that we hear quite a bit, um, whether it's as a part of design conversations, whether it's a part of uh, larger digital initiatives. Um, and I think there's real value there. I mean, it's, it's completely true that 
thinking API led will get you very far. I think the challenge is thinking only API led uh, is going to have inevitable pitfalls. So the first example is if you are in a position to take some existing monolithic applications that are in place and uh, move them to more of a microservices architecture. You're distributing the services uh, rather than one large application that has sub processes. You now have, let's say, 10 microservices that are very specific task oriented. Uh, and because of that, you have the ability now to very quickly iterate, change, and work on those services without bringing down the whole ecosystem as you would have previously as a part of that monolith. So you've dramatically improved your development pipeline as a part of that microservices shift. Now, if we didn't do anything beyond that. And then you move to your consumer model, you switched hats over there to somebody who's actually consuming those APIs. Rather than calling into a single application now, I now have a few different services I need to call. Um, and, and often that can lead to additional frustration and challenge, right? So I mean, it's the same content available. Um, you're iterating faster, so there may be some benefit over there. But if as a consumer, that, complex, that complexity is passed on to me, uh, I haven't necessarily benefited from that kind of a change. So I think that's where you start to take in the concept of an experience driven approach as well. So in addition to putting in those additional APIs, which will improve your backend ability to iterate and be agile, taking in the concept of what an experience based uh, layer would look like, I think really polishes off the second end of that spectrum to make sure you're getting the most value out of it. Uh, a great example of an experience uh, service layer or API is something like a GraphQL service. So uh, a very good example, again, if you carry across that scenario where you have those 10 microservices, um, as a consumer, if I'm only interested in a subset from service A, I need to call some elements from services two through four, um, I have a few different options without that GraphQL service. I can call all of them in parallel. I can wait for all of the responses to come back, keep them in memory in my application, do some post-processing, get to the eventual data set that I need, and then present that at my UI layer. Um, or I can sequentially do it if I need to actually know what results come back from service A to then call service two, three, four, et cetera. Uh, and obviously that's a lot of chattiness, it's network latency. It's a lot of throughput on the back end as well. Now, if I can collapse all of that through an experience layer like GraphQL, um, that same application, more of a query-based uh, approach, can simply make a single request accessing the ultimate uh, end goal of the data that it's looking for, and then let that GraphQL service then transact and reach out to all the individual services, find the subsets of data that need to come back from them, and provide a single response back. So now what we've done is, again, those 10 services continue to operate at a distributed level, uh, but you've given a unique entry level approach to that consumer so they can fine tune the exact request they want to make and look for the very specific response they need back. And now from an overhead on a throughput perspective, a bandwidth perspective, and an in-memory handling perspective, we've made that entire experience much more lean and effective as well. So uh, obviously one example of what that can do uh, but it really broadens the perspective as you go down that journey of thinking API-led is to make sure you're not neglecting the concept of experience-driven design uh, and architecture as well. So number two, and I, I, uh, I like this picture. If you look at the guy, he, he, he doesn't look like he's having a very good time. It always kind of I always have a bit of a fun time just thinking through all the people who put together these mock images for a purchase or distribution just to see what they've given them for perspective over there. Um, monolithic gateways and the challenges they present, right? So uh, I think as you go through typical infrastructures that haven't gone down that journey yet to becoming cloud native, uh, potentially also if you've had an infrastructure in place for some time without some recent innovations, it wouldn't surprise me to, to know that you have some kind of an infrastructure in place where you have a lot of traffic being driven through a north south bound type ecosystem. Uh, what, what that means is if for every type of request coming into your ecosystem, we need to drive that through a single gateway and whether it's in a consumer application calling a backend service, whether it's internal service calling another, having that kind of traffic go through a single gateway or even solution uh, presents a number of challenges. And that actually taps into a, uh, 
another lesson learned that I'm going to get to in a few minutes. But having that single gateway be in the edge more often than not, uh, if it's monolithic, presents its own challenges. Uh, firstly, from a, a rigidity perspective, if you don't have the ability to scale out individual components of that ecosystem so that you can adapt to your specific traffic distribution patterns, uh, some examples being if your increase in traffic is predominantly heavy on your cache resources, you may not need to scale up the whole infrastructure that adds on maybe additional logging, traffic runtime capacity as well. Uh, and if you do so, now you have additional overhead and resource consumption, uh, which is now taking away from your ability to apply that towards the actual backend services that you're trying to serve. Um, so the ability to have those components be distributed so that they're highly elastic. And then as a part of that, they're also uh, leveraging inbuilt resiliency when you come to services and orchestration layers like Swarm and Kubernetes, uh, being first class citizens at that layer really helps you to become a more agile and cloud native uh, member of that ecosystem. And we spoke a bit about the ability to be elastic and highly available. Uh, the second end of that would be to ensure that you are making sure that that runtime, that point of policy enforcement is available where you need it. Now, there are going to be times where you're going to have a set of business policies that need to be enforced for, let's say, external partners, consumers, or even other business units where you want to make sure they're tied to a specific SLA based off their contract, their terms. Uh, and it makes sense to execute that policy, that authentication um, type of enforcement as close to the edge of where that request is coming from. You may not want to have that go all the way down to your trusted zone, so to speak. Now, uh, there's a quite a bit of a different perspective when you switch hats to more of a developer or an operator perspective where you may be less concerned uh, about the business policies that are being put at that distribution layer, but you may want to protect your backend capacity. You have very specific insights with regards to the amount of services, the instances that are running to provide that service. You know at a detailed level the amount of concurrent connections that can be handled, what your possibility is for burst traffic. So you want to put in things like circuit breaker type infrastructures. You want to make sure that um, from a resiliency perspective and a traffic shaping perspective that you have control over things like blue green rollouts. So if you're iterating from version one to two, you have the ability to control, let's say 10% of that traffic to your new service to understand if it's meeting your requirements. Um, putting all of that in a singular monolithic uh, policy enforcement layer presents a number of challenges in terms of upkeep, change management, uh, and then just the funnel through which those changes need to be approved. So providing micro gateways and technologies that can be deployed in more of a sidecar type pattern really help to augment the policies that are typically provided at a business layer while giving the development and operator teams at a more granular level the ability to add on their additional policies either to protect or to add on additional scrutiny based off the specific use cases over there. So I cheated ahead a little bit before, uh, but it's worth coming back to. Uh, so leveraging API network topologies that are hierarchical versus uh, more horizontal uh, can lead to frustrations beyond just the technical architecture, but into the actual IT landscape as well. Um, if all of your requests fundamentally need to go back up to one zone, whether it's a trusted zone, whether it's closer to your DMZ or in your DMZ, um, you're eventually going to wind up with a ton of latency, a lot of hops. You're going to be going between a number of appliances, potentially load balancers, security appliances. Uh, and while that may be a valid use case for north-southbound type traffic that's coming in where external consumers are making their requests to hit your backend services, it may very well be worthwhile to have it going through that funnel because you want to do your payload scrutiny, you want to do your content inspection, make sure there's no malicious code, um, things like that. But if you have that same approach for service to service or intra service calls, um, particularly for working with the microservices infrastructure and every single business API call that is made, is eventually needs to maybe cross three, four internal services. You can imagine in your head the amount of up and down transactions that would need to take place and the amount of overall latency that that would impose to the end user experience and to your internal network as well. So 
as you start to expand out that concept of a distributed infrastructure, as you move towards more of a microservices uh, design landscape, there's tremendous value in taking in the ability to more horizontally manage the communication between these service to service interactions. Not only can you ensure that there is a continued zero trust type initiative, so that if you are implementing a policy such that even for a service to service call, you want to ensure that every service identifies itself. It has some assertions that it provides to that next service so that it can then make its own decision with regards to whether or not to approve a request to deny one or to only provide some subset of options to it. Um, a more horizontal approach to that not only becomes faster, but it becomes a closer policy enforcement layer to where that service is, which optimizes the overall workflow there. So when you come to server capacity, uh, I think I, I may tweak the title over here. It says when it comes to servers, less is more. Um, I, I think there is a place for where that fixed capacity has value, but I think generally the title holds water. Um, cheating ahead over there. I'll come back and provide a little context to that. So I think as you go through your planning process and you're you're looking at the types of services you have uh, based off the usage patterns, based off your consumption model, if you have fairly predictable constant traffic that's coming in for complex transactions, uh, you know that no matter what, 99% of the time you're between 1,000 and 1,200 queries per second, you know, the average backend latency. Uh, it may make sense just to have a fixed capacity service in place so that that server is available with some amount of buffer so you have a best practice implementation in place, uh, but not necessarily have to go through the lengths of maybe re-architecting it because there may not be as much value to extrapolate around that kind of a particular use case. Now, if I were to turn that on its head a bit, and I were to say, if you've got a traffic distribution model where you have extremely peak load, jaggedy, or uh, I like to say um, spiky traffic, uh, that's where it becomes a bit more challenging. So do you, if you are working in a fixed capacity resource manner, do you size for the highest peak load traffic that you could process? And if that's maybe 10x, 20x, or even 5x more, than what your average traffic looks like, then how much are you paying for an operational overhead either at a resource level to manage that infrastructure and at the IT level to actually keep those servers, whether they're on-prem, whether they're in the cloud, on and running? So, so a much different approach, particularly when you're working with event-driven services, is to take advantage of serverless technology like functions as a service so that as these either events occur or these services are invoked, you can very quickly spin up the process that needs to transact against that request or that event, process it, serve the response, and then scale back down to zero. Now, there are variances to that as well, depending on the cloud provider you go with, the infrastructure you wind up using, it can go from zero to infinity. Um, so if you look at something like Azure Functions, you look at functions as a service of AWS. Uh, and if you look at something like Google Cloud Run, you could very well have something where you have very maybe very minimal fixed capacity where you just scale up container instances uh, as needed to make sure you can meet demand, but then come back down to some very floor level based capacity. I think the general takeaway though is to really evaluate the type of services that you have uh, and really make sure that you're taking the best advantage of the improvements that have been put into place to process these types of transactions and that you're taking advantage of the ability to scale up to meet those requests. Again, scenario that we didn't necessarily cover is in that spiky type traffic flow. You would never really need to worry about if the traffic went to 30x instead of 20x because the auto scale feature would just scale up to handle that load. Uh, whereas if you did have that feature implemented in a fixed cost scenario or a fixed resource scenario, um, if you start to exceed those peak levels, you're very quickly put into a position where you now need to start reevaluating what that infrastructure looks like and how you can quickly spin up additional fixed capacity to meet that demand. And anytime you're put into a scenario where you need to put human bodies against design, implementation, uh, deployment, uh, that's time lost towards actually accommodating for and meeting the demand and more spent on planning and more preparation. So 
another way of looking at this, and again, as, as we look at all the content that's coming through as a part of the conference, uh, this in the next few days, uh, I imagine you'll see quite a bit about events. And I think the reason that it's relevant, and there's a few, are that no matter how great an application is in terms of the value that it provides, uh, how effectively it's programmed, it's scripted, whether it's a monolith, whether it's distributed as microservices, uh, if it's fundamentally built on a model where it's waiting on an invocation to begin that workflow, uh, you would argue, especially from an event-driven architecture, architecture perspective, that there's some inherent flaw. Uh, if I've got a, a mobile application that I've developed, and uh, it's an application, I'll choose a wacky one. I'm from Brooklyn and there's a huge coffee culture here. And you know, some of it's pretentious, some of this more hipster driven. I'm probably somewhere in the middle, just a little bit of a uh, self-deprecation over there. But uh, if I need to call in to understand the latest types of coffee that are available at my local brewery, um, what is the most effective manner to do that interaction? So from an, an application perspective, do I just set up a polling mechanism where I constantly check? Um, do I check once a day? Do I check twice a day? Do I wait for my user to actually put in a request to check against the updated stock? Um, all of that is kind of built on the premise that the data is available. It's sitting on the back end. It's exposed by the services, but it's basically waiting for somebody to make that restful request to make that interaction to provide the content back. Now, if we flip that, and we make it more event-driven, um, we still have the same data that was available previously, but we're gonna treat and react to it very differently. So if I flip up that model a bit, and I'll if you follow along, I'll start with on the diagram from simple event processing, and I'll go clockwise from there. Um, a very simple event could be that I now now have a new uh, coffee that's available. Uh, I just found it at a local source and I'm starting to sell it in small batches. If I can blast that out as an event to all the consumers that are leveraging my service, um, it's sent out to them in real time. So as a, as a consumer of this application, I didn't need to necessarily log in and request to see as a refresh or have the application constantly polling to see has something you've been added. I, as a, as a developer, as the API provider, simply let everybody know who was a part of my consumer set that I now have this available and it's been pushed out to everyone. Um, and if I flip that and I now look at this from an API provider perspective and people who are browsing now my catalog and I see that a lot of people are looking for this type of coffee, um, it's an interesting event. I can see that they've, they've come into the catalog and they keep checking for this type of coffee and that can drive maybe an interaction to see how people want to maybe look more into that type of a brew, into that type of a micro batch. Now, if I move that into a stream, I shift away from looking at it as an individual event, but as a collection of events. Now, if I look at it more holistically and I see across all of Brooklyn, uh, I have hundreds of users that are not all of a sudden asked for this type. Um, it, it, it's, it broadens the perspective so that I'm not necessarily looking at this through a single consumer lens, but I'm understanding that there's some kind of trend that's emerging as a part of my ecosystem. Now start to look at that um, as I move to more contextual based processing to say, well, why are all these events occurring? Or is there some other context that's being applied or misses a part of that ecosystem? And if I refine that to say, well, most of them are coming from within New York, but they're mostly from, let's say, two of the boroughs, Queens and Brooklyn, but not necessarily Staten Island. Staten Island loves their cold brew, but they don't necessarily love, let's say, uh, espresso instead. The next time what I could do as I move to my AI and ML driven logic is so that when users start to log in from these different regions of New York, based off the contextual history of what these people looked at, based off the trends that we've seen in the past, I can now get proactive in terms of the communication models and say, hey, it seems like you're from New York and based off your profile, it looks like you're from Staten Island. Are you interested in this new cold brew that we've come up with in the last few days? And Rather than having that customer go through, find and search for that content, we can use all that context to make sure it's not only available, but it's put in front of that customer for an improved user experience. And hopefully at the end of the day, as a more seamless path to a sale. So I think all of that is one, one example 
of how you can start to look at these integration potentials through the lens of events and applying them contextually and then leveraging AI and ML technology to really hone the best value of them. And, and that brings us to a bit of a case study where we've seen similar approaches being put into place by Caesars. Uh, for those that haven't been, it's a, a casino in Las Vegas, uh, a, a rich experience across hospitality from the gambling industry to great restaurants. Um, as you could imagine, as people navigate throughout that ecosystem, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of data points that are being collected as people are checked in, as people go to their rooms and purchase orders for uh, housekeeping, uh, or rather a uh, room service, I should say, um, to the types of uh, interest they have from a gambling perspective. Do tip people typically, through their loyalties rewards, uh, load up so that they, they can play at maybe different types of uh, casino games on the floor? Do they... Uh, participate more at table games? Are they partial to poker versus Baccarat, et cetera? As you apply all of the context together, like Caesars did, not only can you become more proactive in how you take that information and make it available to your service representatives so they can provide and extend a more rich and customized user experience to their customers, they can also take that data and analyze it and apply the same type of AI and ML type technologies to see as they iterate both at a technology and at an operational level, what types of interests are being shown in terms of different floor games, different types of services that are being provided, so they can use that as a model to iterate and handle additional upkeep. So uh, a good example of that, um, some of the solution sets listed out in the slide over here. Uh, but again, great integration points, how how they leverage a lot of this distributed and siloed data that they already had. They didn't need to retool the services. They simply needed to tap into it more. And we'll talk into to a bit more about the concept of uh, macro services and mini services and micro services and how you can use them to augment some of the content you already have. Um, but they took that wealth of data set that they had and they made sure that it was available in the moment as the events were taking place, as opposed to analyzing them in a post-mortem manner where you may not have been able to extrapolate as much value out of it if it wasn't done in that scenario. So uh, as we go from over there, lesson six, uh, so don't let it queue up. So I, I wanted to open this up with, and I, and I hope it's been coming across that there are technologies as we talked about kind of fixed capacity versus serverless. Over here, we'll talk a little bit of a comparison between something like JMS for messaging versus Pulsar or Kafka in that th there still continues to be a home for these technologies, right? This doesn't necessarily mean to become cloud native, to, to really go forward in that strategy, you have to drop every single set of technology that you've had that was implemented a few years back, right? It's simply not true. And more often than not, if you try to have that kind of a hard sever, um, you're going to wind up putting yourself through a lot of pain and frustration. So uh, JMS and similar queuing based technologies, I think continue to have a home in a lot of enterprises across multiple verticals. Uh, it's reliable, it works, it can be counted on once it's implemented correctly. Uh, but there are inherent flaws in how that kind of a technology can work as you move towards something that's more cloud native, as you move towards something that's more globally distributed in kind of a modern application design framework. Um, so a couple of examples of that are how easy is it to scale something like that? How easy or how fast is that content made available to the consumers uh, and at what kind of availability do you have to provide options to opt into, to subscribe to different subsets of that data? Now, if I look at it as, again, through a mobile application lens, particularly when I'm conscious of how much in-memory handling I need to process, how much data I need to pull down to process the specific subsets of data that I want, if I need to subscribe to a queue, I constantly need to pull against it, uh, a more of a, an imperative type of design where I'm constantly asking for what's available, parsing out the content that's not relevant to me after I've already downloaded it. Um, there's some inherent flaw, I think, in how effective how something like that would operate. Again, in the context of a mobile application that's working in a global infrastructure. Now, if we start to look at this from more of a pub sub or publisher subscriber type approach with something like Apache Pulsar, um, 
you, you gain a number of advantages over something that's traditionally made available through a traditional queuing system. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, it's going to become reactive rather than imperative. And what that, what that fundamentally means, and you know, there's a number of wealth of articles that get into very low level details on this, but it essentially lets you define uh, a process to say, hey, I'm interested in these specific types of data. So rather than looking at the entire queue as my mobile application, I want to look at data that's available in topics one, two, and five. So whenever there is something new and available in one, two, and five, you let me know. I'm not going to constantly need to poll and ask for is something available or something available. Once it is available, it'll be blasted out to me in real time. Um, secondly, as something like that needs to scale out, as you need to blast out thousands of these alerts, if you're thinking of something like a LinkedIn, something like a Twitter, just think about the amount of traffic that's being pushed through and published to multiple consumers and some consumers that may want to go back and review previous records as well. Uh, the concept of immutable records, the ability to go back and look at logs that may have already been processed or accessed, but may still need to be available to consumers that did not have the chance to go back and get it while others did. All of these different types of requests, the ability to scale and meet those types of demands, the ability to have that kind of throughput to drive something like in a Twitter or a LinkedIn type application uh, really hones in on and defines the use case around what that kind of a pub sub model is geared for and how you can take advantage of that kind of a technology to really get out that message and make it highly available and fast and performant at the same time. So lesson learned number seven. So uh, <laughs> breaking news, right? Developers don't love it when you tell them in a very prescriptive manner that we've standardized on this programming stack and you need to use this IDE because everyone else uses that ID in that environment. Uh, and we don't want to introduce that variance into our ecosystem. Um, I, I think the, the general thought process around that comes from the right place. And it's people trying to say, as, as I work across these new initiatives and I have multiple team members working on it, um, if they're all using exactly the same programming language and stack and framework, then uh, if the team members get moved around or they get reallocated to new projects, team member A, who was not working on that initiative, can very easily move over and pick up on that uh, initiative and move forward. Um, the downside to that is not every single resource is going to be proficient on every single language and not every language is going to be as effective based on what the business criteria and use cases for developing that service. Um, so if you can give your team the flexibility, uh, particularly through a microservices or distributed services infrastructure to say, use the tool set, use the language, and framework, language framework that makes the most sense for the job and is most tied to the resource sets that you have, we can always abstract that complexity from our consumer level by putting in that experience API, that business API facade. And now what you've done is you've enabled your team rather than box them in to say, develop the service in as fast and quick a manner as you can with the right tools that are available. And once you've got that service, if you do need to standardize because you're ultimately serving a larger business application or you want to have some standardization at the consumption layer, uh, if that's not already achieved at the microservice it itself, you have that experience layer that can then come in on top and enforce that type of either uh, conversion or appliance ahead of it. Now, as we talk about some of the additional services, we'll come back to how we can get into different frameworks, but. Again, I think the key element there is that polyglot technologies and polyglot development frameworks, um, while they do introduce some uh, complexity at the uh, at the services layer, uh, all the way down, um, the overwhelming benefit of making your team more agile and ability to adapt to new changes, new infrastructure requirements uh, outweighs all the challenges noted over there. Number eight. So. Uh, as, as you look at the, the explosion of kind of an event-driven architecture and how people are starting to tap into that kind of an ecosystem, much like you saw with more standard web HTTP APIs maybe five or six years ago, uh, there's a natural need that's born of that to say, we now need to make sure that all these new great event-driven services are discoverable, that there's a place for somebody to go and find that content, to interact with it, to work with it, and then eventually to request access to it. Um, I think we've seen more than once 
the question raised whether or not that kind of a portal should be where their existing developer portal is or if it should be a separate one. And, and I think the fundamental argument and the challenge we would pose back is that regardless of whether or not you're working with these standard web APIs, these synchronous services or asynchronous services that are more event driven, uh, these are all fundamentally APIs. And, and if you boil it down to that concept, then you really make it a simple answer and say, well, this is still just your development portal. You just added some additional types of services into that ecosystem. Now, uh, when we get to a little bit later on in some of the lessons learned, we can talk about how we can make sure that in doing so, you still need to make sure that the available tool sets and content are available for those users to be successful as a part of that initiative. There's one aspect is just being able to find maybe this new event driven service or application. There's another end to say, now I wanna be able to test or work with it, much like I would with um, your uh, traditional RESTful or uh, SOAP-based services. Um, and, and we'll come to that in a moment, but there's no reason to fragment that landscape. As soon as you introduce additional portals, the overhead for keeping content in two different sections, the adaption rate becomes challenged in that as consumers go to find your content, if they hit one portal, they simply may not know that there's other content in the other portal. And if they go to one portal and then are linked to the other, it just leads to kind of a confusing user experience with regards to, well, I, I have some interest in these APIs, but then these other APIs live someplace else. Uh, and you really will do yourself some favors upfront if you look at this from a more general manner and saying that, again, all of these services are APIs. They should all be in one roof. API analytics beyond the dashboard. So uh, oftentimes, uh, both as a part of an implementation team member, later on in pre-sales and ultimately in product, uh, as I've engaged with partners as a part of QBRs and follow-ups, uh, we'll go through and we'll analyze their API program and we'll ask, in addition to some of the analytics and metrics that we have available, uh, how they're then taking that and then applying it as a part of all the other context and business um, data that they have available. Um, and sometimes you'll see that that kind of a process being put into, put into place, uh, but an overwhelming amount of times we'll come back, we'll be challenged with the fact of what's the relevance of that, right? I, I wanted to talk about how my API program is doing. What does that necessarily have to do with all these other data drivers that we may not necessarily always interact with? Um, and I think sometimes that's very straightforward uh, in that if you run a checkout service and you can see that X amount of people call the actual service for a checkout, you could assume that some kind of transaction is taking place and you can drive some assumptions around the type of value that that's providing. Um, but if you're not overlaying that with the business context of knowing uh, where did that user come from? And if you've seen all the checkouts occur, how many of them ultimately wound up in returns? Uh, were all of those returns driven from user experiences that were on the mobile application as opposed to your web application? Uh, are they coming from a specific region? Are they specific product related? Uh, for those users, what type of application did they actually use to get to it, right? So is it a first party application? Is it a third party application? A lot of these data points you may be able to get particularly with the confines of your API program, which is extremely valuable, rate it knowing your adoption rates, knowing whether or not you're meeting, exceeding your SLA requirements internally or externally to consumers. Uh, but without applying that additional business context, you're leaving a wealth of data at the, at the sidelines over here in terms of understanding what your ultimate bottom line impact is to your business. Uh, so, so as you go through that, again, tremendous value in understanding the metrics that are provided purely from your API program in general. Uh, but, but make sure not to neglect the fact that there is a lot more value to be provided if you can then overlay that against that additional content to really understand again, what kind of impact and performance you're driving from that solution set. Uh, and the last item over here, and we'll do a little bit of a wrap up just to kind of pull everything together, uh, is to build inclusive portals. So we spoke a bit before about making sure that you have one portal for all your event APIs, for your asynchronous, synchronous, your RESTful services. Um, 
you also want to make sure that as you go through additional resource mappings, as you drive this additional business context, all these additional reports and tool sets to actually work with these services, that you're extending them back into your portal too, right? So if you're using something like a GraphQL service and you've provided business policies to access it, make sure you're you're providing the right tool sets like the graphical playground so that people can actually test out and work with those services right from the portal. If you've gone through the lengths of providing additional user application or business context, obviously within the confines of what's appropriate to the right types of audiences and users, extend those reports either through JS extensions or through any other, other kind of uh, embeddable HTML content into the portal itself. The more you can make that portal a one-stop shop, not just for your API developers, but for business stakeholders and for anyone who's genuinely interested in the content that you're providing, regardless of the level of technical uh, experience or involvement in the API ecosystem, the more value you can derive out of the program that you're providing and the overall success that your program is going to be yielding. So as, as we begin to wrap that up then, and we kind of summarize the 10 lessons learned that we've been looking at into three main topics over here, uh, I think we wanted to really drive home three points. Uh, firstly is to make sure you are driving a multi-experience in uh, process. Um, regardless if you're supporting a portal, whether you're driving internal employee applications or third-party services, this is going to be facilitated through a unique and feature rich development portal that has all of your services available to make sure that you have an experience layer, an experience set of APIs to make sure that these various types of applications can interact with and access the content they're looking for without imposing additional change management and overhead to your development teams for every new type of use case that comes up. As you move to your outer APIs or sometimes referred to as your business API layer, you want to make sure that you have all the two set tool sets available to provide your distribution, your onboarding, your authentication logic, the ability to drive any event type integration as people are making requests as they're occurring and then putting that out to your consumer base. And you want to make sure that you're providing the ability at that outer application level to leverage low code, no code process automation type workflows so that without, again, having to go down to your inner API, your microservices layer, you have the ability to build on those either facade APIs or annotation APIs to extrapolate additional value based off the varying business use cases and needs that come up. Last but not least, towards the bottom over there, you want to make sure that your inner APIs, and these are going to be those existing monoliths that you already have that are functioning super well, they're rock solid. You know, maybe nobody's touched it in four years, but it keeps chugging along. There's no reason to break up that service. There's no reason to retool it and re-architect it. You have the ability to build on facades on top of it. You have the ability to leverage uh, mini services, if you will, so that if you only need to now start chopping up bits and pieces of the content that that, ma that macro service, that monolith provides, you can build that facade API on top of it and begin to bring out additional business value out of it without having to retool it. Uh, and then you have your microservices infrastructure as well, the concept and the confines of leveraging things like service mesh-like integrations, horizontal type interaction service models, and the ability to leverage micro gateways so as you're either bounding contexts or you're adding on more granular level controls, you're empowering the right personas and the right teams across all these domains and segments, outer APIs, inner APIs, to do what they need to do without running into some of the traditional challenges that are imposed by traditional IT um, design concepts like having monolithic gateways drive 100% of the logic and the ability to rapidly change and adapt to any updates without having to go to a single team that may be working at a different layer or a different segment in your IT infrastructure. So at that, um, I'll come to my next slide over here. I'll extend my thanks to everybody who's joined. I know we started a few minutes late, so I apologize for that. I'm just going to do a quick time check over here um, and open it up to see if there's any questions or any other uh, comments that we can uh, address at this point.
All right. So um, I want to thank you all again for joining. I know that we have a, a few questions that are coming in. If we're unable to get at it here, we're going to have virtual booth hours happening both today, tomorrow, and the day afterwards. So find the time zone that matches your requirement. We're going to have a number of resources available to follow up on specific questions. Uh, and if you have any kind of follow-ups, don't hesitate to reach out to our staff. And if you have any continued interest, um, especially with along the lines of the responses at Nash, Nash type technology we've referenced, uh, we have an ebook and we have some content that's recently been made available. So if you Google TIPCO and responsive app mesh, you'll be able to easily pull down that ebook and see some of the content from over there and learn a bit more about that blueprint for success. Thank you again for joining. Stay well, stay safe, everybody, and have a great day.